Hello, hello, and welcome to Digital Wood Carver or Spindle TV. <laughs> um, the uh, tonight's class, we're gonna do a QA, live QA. We're gonna we're not getting started yet. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes. Let me answer one quick question that somebody messaged me online and we'll get started here. Uh, Let's see here. I'm in a live class. Get with me later after nine. Okay, sorry about that. We had a live one come in, pop a question, pop in right as I started class. Uh, so tonight we're going to do a live Q&A, but also I told you last week when we created that watch face model, in Aspire, I showed you how uh, that I would uh, show you how to create that same type of carving uh, and design inside of eCard Pro. Now we're not going to recreate the vectors. I'm just going to import them in. You'll see when we get in the software. Um, but uh, if you want to learn how to create the vectors and everything, I did that in last week's class. But tonight we're going to import the vectors and we're going to create a you know V-carve toolpath combination of some pocket cuts and stuff. We're going to create that same project without having to build a model. For those of you that don't have Aspire, and you may only have Vectric VCard Desktop or Vectric VCard Pro. Now, if you want the 3D model, uh, it is available for sale at $7.50 to download. You can just email me uh, with the subject line uh, watch face model, and I would be happy to uh, send you an invoice for that. Uh, and I'll put my email address in the chat. Um, Shaughnessy at SpindleTV.com. Laney.Shaughnessy at SpindleTV.com. That's my email if you want to email me for that model. But we're going to show you how to uh, create the file in VCar Pro and stuff. But before we get started with any of that, uh, we are going. I'm going to take questions uh, and answers and stuff. So if you have uh, any questions, throw them up in the chat area, and I will uh, be answering your questions for you. But before we get started with anything, um, I've just downloaded uh, Vectric VCar Pro 11, okay, and I just installed it. And for those of you that are new to 11 that are getting ready to make that migration over uh, from 10, 10.5, or whatever to 11, uh, whether you're in Desktop Pro or Aspire, I want to show you what the new Kickstarter is uh, as far as uh, how to set up version 11 uh, for your machine. Many OEMs, uh, official equipment manufacturers uh, for Vetric, uh, Digital Wood Carver being one of them, uh, Next Wave Automations and, and all these others. Uh, we submitted all this data and file information regarding the machines, that the type of machines we have, so that Vetric could input that all into a big database uh, that will allow a user, when they're setting up their V11, to set up their machine configurations in the software which will help with their post processors and their tool database and everything like that. Uh, so we're actually at the very first few moments of class, we're going to go in and we're gonna set up my VCarve 11, uh, my new install of VCarve 11, uh, to kind of give you a guide on how you would set yours up when you upgrade to uh, V11. I know a lot of people have asked about that. So we're gonna take just a few minutes at the beginning of class here and we're gonna do that setup together. Uh, from there, we're going to go into the VCarve, we're going to import our uh, vectors for our watch face model, and we're going to uh, create that design using a combination of V-carving, pocket cutting, and things. Uh, and we're going to uh, answer y'all's questions. So go ahead and pose the questions in there, and I will be stopping periodically to answer those questions and everything. And once we get through with the design uh, and stuff and get through with your questions, We'll call it a night, and uh, you know, hopefully you'll gain something or some information from tonight's class. So let's get started. I am on uh, camera two, so let me switch over to that. Uh, let's go to camera two, get that behind me, and let's put me down in the bottom left corner. All right, here I am way down here. All right, everybody. Cool. So I hope y'all are doing well. I really thank you for coming and joining me tonight. I didn't know if I was going to be able to have a class tonight with that phone ringing and 
uh, customer calls and, and training sessions and stuff. It was a busy day to day, I tell you. All right, so looking at the software here, I have Vetric VCar Pro open. Now, right immediately after install, you're going to get a window that pops up uh, asking if you want to configure your machine. Now, my window's not popped up because I kind of canceled it out, and uh, I want to go through this with you guys and girls. So the first thing I'm going to do is, for me is I'm going to go up to the Help menu, and I'm going to go down to Kickstarter Wizard. I'm going to click on uh, make sure that I'm connected. If I'm not, I'm going to log in and I am connected to my account. So I'm going to click next and it's going to ask me about searching for my machine online, that database that they created. So I'm going to hit search and it's going to download all the machines and give me this wizard here. So the first thing I'm going to do is from the list of manufacturers, these are the manufacturers that help help. Uh, create version 11 by submitting their information on their tool databases, their post processors, their machines and things. And Digital Wood Carver for me is right here in the list. So our series is DWC and my particular model is 2440. And then my machine is a rotary axis. I'm gonna have the default check the rotary axis and I do also have the laser module as well. So with those three boxes checked, I'm going to go ahead and download the configurations for my machine. It's going to say you're about to install the machine configurations for a DWC 2440. Would you like to continue? Yes. Successfully installed three machine configurations. So we have three machine configurations uh, for the default, fourth axis, and the laser module. So then I'll go ahead and click finish. and you don't see any real change over here uh, where the change if I go in and create a new file and let's go ahead and create the file for the job we're doing tonight uh, we're gonna go I'm gonna go 18 by 18 is good uh, on this one I don't need to go inch and a half thick I'm gonna go three quarter inch thick I'm gonna zero out on the material surface and I'm going to start at the bottom left corner for me. You can start anywhere you'd like to. And we're going to go ahead and click OK. So now I'm in my job setup. While I'm here, let's go ahead and import that DXF file. So we're going to go to Import a Vector in my Drawing tab under File Operations. I'm going to come over to my DXF file here, which is called Watch Face. I'm going to import that file in. Now that file is much bigger than 18 inches by 18 inches currently. Uh, currently it's 23 by 23. So I will uh, either, you know, if I want to size it down, I'm going to size it down or I'd size it up. I'm going to go ahead and size it down. So let's go uh, scale the selection from the center. Let's go 18 by 18 and click apply. Very good. Now I'm going to go into my alignment tool and I'm going to align it to the center of the material. Excellent. So right up to that edge. Cool. Now, let's take a quick peek over at the uh, toolpath side of the software. Now, we haven't created anything yet uh, or done anything. We're going to talk more about this in just a minute. But let's go over to the toolpath side of the software and let's look at our tool database for a moment. So in our tool database, uh, I have my DWC uh, Digital Woodcarver Tool Library default here. Uh, and notice that all the tools are currently grayed out, okay? Up here in the top right corner, because I did set the software up for the 2440, I've got it right here, but I also have all of our machines set here, 1824, 2440, 4850, uh, and then I can, you know, set up, uh, you know, all the individuals. I'm just going to go with the default, which is going to be the overall general for this machine. Now, Axiom and Next Wave Automation and all the other ones and things, their configurations, you know, you're going to have their model, the type, and things like that. And they're going to, it'll bring in whatever configurations they submitted, you know, tool database, post processors, all that stuff. But now, since I'm set up here at default, uh, none of my tools are, you know, they're all grayed out. Okay. Uh, they are, there's nothing active here. And so I have to make those tools active. I kind of wish there, there was one major button 
uh, that would you know generate and make them active. But uh, if I go and look at my 1824 files here, notice on my 1824 Mini Carver, you know most some of the buttons are active and stuff, you know on the tools and everything. Uh, the only ones that aren't active are the default tools that came with that Vetric kind of threw in there. So the tool database that I submitted uh, for the company are all these tools that are kind of lit up and colorful. The ones that are grayed out are some of the ones that you know were already kind of inside of the uh, uh, the Vetric software and stuff, and they kind of merged them together. That I'm gonna try to have a video conference with Vetric and see if uh, you know we can correct that and stuff. See if we can make some changes on that uh, because if I've submitted a tool database for my users. Uh, when they configure their machine, I'd like that tool database to be completely set up without having to do any extra work. Now, it may be the way that I submitted the files as far as why the 1824 are all lit up and the 2440 are grayed out uh, in things, but uh, either way, uh, they'll let me know during that video conference, hopefully. Well, as we look through here and uh, in all, uh, like I said, all the ones of the tools that I did submit, they're all grayed out or lit up, but the ones that are part of the Vetric, they're all grayed out. Now for me, I don't, I don't want those tools, so I'm just going to right click and I'm going to hide the unset tools. That'll get rid of those. Okay, it'll hide them all. So now I have all of my active tools, my bowl and tray bits, dummy bits, and end mills and everything. V bits and stuff. So I, I'm only seeing the active tools and the tools are active because of the, you know, the tool database that was created or imported during that setup. Uh, I don't want to see all the other miscellaneous stuff that's not part of my tool database. Um, other companies may have created a tool database with their kind of recommended speeds and feed settings and things for you that when you set up your machine, uh, they're already ready to go. I don't know. I, I, you know, I can't speak for them. I can only speak for what we did at Digital Woodcarver. So the tools are all set up. I've turned off or hid the ones that weren't because they weren't part of our tool database. And all of these tools, uh, their speeds and feeds and settings and everything are all set to go. So my tool database is good to go there. I don't need to do anything. Now, let's say that you're jumping from 10.5 to 11 or 10 to 11 and you have your own custom tool database that you've created. You've added a bunch of tools that you've purchased, you know, uh, from other, you know, Woodcraft and Rockler and toolstoday.com and all these wonderful things. And you want your tool database. Well, hopefully you have, when you're in 10.5, you have taken and uploaded that tool database, that's these two little clouds here when you're logged into your tool database. Hopefully you've uploaded that to your account. Because if you did, then you can simply click the download file and you can download your tool database. Your custom, you don't have to use the tool database that, um, that was pre-configured. You know, we submitted a tool database with pre-configured settings, but many users have their own tools that they've added along the way. And our tool database is not a complete list of every tool out there, of course. So you may want to download your own tool database, and that's fine. If you have not, and you have Vetric 10.5, go over to your close out of 11, go back over and open up 10.5, go to your tool database and upload that current tool database that you're used to working with every day. Upload it to your account so that when you come back into version 11, you can download it. And that's these two little buttons at the top of the uh, tool database here. Download and upload, right? And uh, it'll keep it synced between all your computers and stuff. So you may have to go for every computer that you've updated. Uh, you may have to go in and, you know, download your, your tool database. I'm going to stick with the default because I created them and all the tools are set exactly the way that I would use them. And uh, I've added a bunch of custom tools in here that are used that not only that we sell, but that I use on a regular basis uh, for, and it's the tools that I recommend to customers when they buy. Now, the tool database is all set up, that's good, and we can now go over and look at the save tool path window, the save tool path window. In the save tool path window, my machine is set to the Digital Wood Carver uh, 2440, 
but it's going to say the active machine DWC2440 does not have any associated post processors. It does, but we have to configure them. We have to kind of pull them in. So we're going to go ahead and we can either configure uh, and we can add post processors from the list and they're all right here with the little pins next to them and things. Uh, or we could have went online if I cancel this and open that again oh not that save toolpath window again uh, and get that window I could just search online uh, it will go on to our account and once again I'm kind of setting up the machine twice for the post processors so I can go to digital woodcarver DWC 2440 default we'll do this and we'll click download so it'll download that and it's saying hey do you want to configure this I'm gonna say yes and so now for my post processors are listed in here uh, for the for the machine and everything if there's any custom post processors for whatever reason that you created or things like that or you don't see the post processor that you're used to using all the time in your list for your machine you can always add it so you can add it uh, from the list here uh, and there's a list of all the different machines digital woodcarver because it's my machine happens to be up at the top here and I can add in custom ones like my laser picture I want to add that one for sure so I'm gonna hit select and I'm gonna apply that to add that one in there and um, that really is all I want for that. I need, I've got my helical arcs inch and my laser picture and I do have millimeter two, but I don't use that one. So that one I can actually remove it out of there uh, cause I don't work in millimeters. Um, I'll click apply and okay. And now my post processor list is set up for my machine. Okay. So Vetric has tried or attempted to make it easier for new users or existing users when they're upgrading to set up their machine configurations which will bring in a tool database uh, for that machine with all the settings and stuff if the manufacturers did their homework and set up the tools properly and stuff and uh, you know and everything and submitted them on time some of them might not have submitted them on time for version 11 so if they submit them later they'll come in later versions you know 11. Point uh, what are we at? Oh, 06, it might be 11.010 or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, slowly the companies will start to kind of build them up and, um, and all. Uh, so we had plenty of advance notice before version 11 was coming out to submit all of our documentation and everything so that we could, when our user sets up a new program, they can just load their machine and it will load everything for them appropriately. That's all there is to the setup of a new installation of the Vetric software with regards to that. Now the last thing I want to do is on my clock here, I want to open this up and I want to make sure that that configuration did set my rapid rate and my scale rate correctly for that machine, which it did. Uh, so uh, that's set up wonderfully. Um, if I owned more than one machine, I can choose whatever machine I happen to be creating this design for. I can actually select the machine uh, appropriately so it'll choose the you know post processors for that machine or or what have you. Um, but uh, I've got my 2440 here. I'm all set up. Uh, so my save tool path, my post processors are set up, my tool database is set up, and my little timer is set up. That's it. I've configured my machine to my software and I'm done. Now again, if you have anything custom, custom post processors, custom tool paths or tool, I'm sorry, tool databases and stuff, all your custom tools, be sure to go back in your version that you were working in before, upload that tool database to your account so that when you're in any new version such as 11, 11.5, on and on and on, you can download your current tools. And as you add new tools to that tool database, be sure to update them. That's saving a backup copy in your account on the Vetric form or Vetric, you know, cloud, uh, and uh, you know, save your current changes, all those new tools. So that way, anytime you need to, if you change computers or uh, you know, you add a second computer or whatever the case may be, 
you can download your tool database so they're both you know both your operating systems are the same and stuff okay okay that is just a quick rundown on setting up vetric and it's it's easy it's the it's the kickstarter and that's all it is you don't have to use the kickstarter you can hit cancel and you can configure things manually on your own and all that stuff but uh, this is kind of a helpful tool for those new users uh, or existing users that just need a little extra hand Vetrix trying to make it a lot easier for them to set up their stuff to be good to go right off the bat okay all right all right all right all right um, so Big Daddy Fish says how do you migrate the old tool list to the new version well Big Daddy if you were listening to me that's what I said we go into if we go over to we'll close out of this let's open up 10.5 I'll show a demonstration of it uh, but we want to upload our old tool database to our cloud account so let's come in here I'll just create a generic file I'm in my 10.5 I'm gonna come over to my tool database here uh, that has my tool database all set up I got a little button here at the top of the tool database that says online uh, I will click that and it's gonna ask me to log in I'll click allow I'll log in and click allow so it kind of connects the two accounts together and once it does that then I have my two buttons my up cloud and my down cloud so if I come in here and click upload it's going to say this will overwrite the tool database that's currently on the server do you wish to continue right for my account on my server do i wish to continue in this case yeah i'll go ahead and uh, say yes and i'll update my changes right my, my current tool database so that's there so that's done okay now i can go into version 11 and go into that tool database and in that tool database I can log in and I can hit the download button to download that current tool database okay so cool beans right and done now let's say that you have an older older version let's say you're in version 8 still or 8.5 or 9 or what have you and you don't have the little online upload and download your tool database buttons well then we're gonna come in here and we're going to select a category or a group we're going to come down to this export button here and we can export out that tool database uh, save it as you know whatever you, my tools you know 8 20 27 whatever you know whatever date not 27 21 um, or whatever but give it a name um, that in and then of course you can import that into version 11 version 11 still has the same little import folder down at the bottom of the screen down here Let's see if you can see where I'm pointing down at the bottom of the screen so we can import that file you know wherever you saved it or 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 you could go to the file menu open application data folder When it opens up the application data folder, you can go into tool database and these tool files here, you could copy them and paste these files into the version 11's application data folder. And that will, these are all your file settings and everything here as well, your tool database. So there's two ways that you could do it old school way, right? If you don't have the newer version, 10, 10.5, you know 10 and 10.5 they started allowing you to upload your tool database to your account as a backup so that it can migrate between all your computers and stuff but it can also it can migrate or you can import it in easily to newer versions that you're upgrading to so we can either go into the application data folder of our older software and grab all the files here and uh, paste it in uh, or it may not there might be a compatibility issue on the file types and stuff and so if that doesn't work for you uh, you know using the application data folder then just go the old school way of opening up your tool database and come into Imperial tools export that tool database out 
save it as you know whatever my tools as of 8 31 21 and you know save that file and then in version 11 we can import that file okay all right all righty all righty all righty so that's how you would do that big daddy fish and anyone else that was curious about that question uh, good afternoon from Vegas. Um, the yes, uh, Michael uh, Meslick has a good um, uh, point as well. Under the help menu, there is an option for migrate from an older version, so you can migrate those information over. Because when you install your software, you know your update and all. The first thing it's going to ask you after the install is finished it's going to ask you if you want to migrate your post processors your tool database and anything else over to the new version check off what you want to migrate and click migrate that's kind of the first thing that occurs right after you install the software but if you miss that window you can go to the help and there's the migrate from older version right there okay so Michael uh, Meslik Meslik thank you very much uh, for throwing that in for Big Daddy Fish as well. Cool beans. All right. Let's see how. All right. Well, let's get back to our design. While again, this is going to be a live Q and A. So if you have questions, ask them. I'll take the time to answer those. Okay. All right. So we have the vectors that we created uh, from last week's class imported in as a DXF. So I saved them as a DXF file. I've got them imported in. Now, if you want to know how to make the vectors from scratch, you know, in your desktop pro or Aspire, uh, watch last week's class. That's the first thing we did is we had to create these vectors from scratch in order to create that model and everything that we did last week. Well, I'm using these same vectors and we're going to, um, we're going to do this with a combination of tool paths to try to create a nice, three-dimensional uh, looking clock face without without uh, making it a 3d model because we don't have a spire to do it right all right so the first thing that I want to do is I'm gonna start out here on the outer face uh, and on these um, circles here oh, 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 oh. I should have grouped them together, but I didn't. I'll do that after the fact, so I don't have to keep clicking them. While I have them selected, I'm gonna hit the letter G. G for group on my keyboard. That's a keyboard shortcut. But if you wanna know where the group tool is, it's under edit objects on the left here. And it is the uh, fourth icon, group, right? Group and ungroup. So that just kind of groups them together. So they're treated like one item and I don't have to click them individually to select them. I can just click one and they'll all select, right? Cool. All right. Um, so for this, uh, these here, these were meant to in the model. They were like a little dimple. Okay. They were like a little dimple and stuff. And uh, so I'm going to uh, do a. Oh, let's see here. I'm going to do it as a drilling operation. I'm going to cut down, let's go 3 sixteenths of an inch. And I, from my tool database, I'm going to use, let's see here. What am I going to use? Let me close my category so I can see them all. box core bit all right so I'm gonna use my 3 8 inch box core bit I might use my quarter inch let me see I first of all let me see what size these holes are so I'm gonna hit U to ungroup I'm gonna select one of those and uh, they are yeah they're 0.58 so they're they're a little over half an inch wide so the 3 8 um, That'll be good, but I think I'm going to go with a half inch. 
because I'm using the drilling toolpath, I need to use the size bit that I want these holes to be, right? Uh, if I use it as a pocket cut, then I can clear out the pocket, okay? I'll show you both toolpaths and you can decide which one would be the better version for you. So let me go through and select these again because I got a little bit ahead of myself. G for group. All right, so in this, I'm gonna come in and from my tool database, I am going to actually select my half inch box core bit and uh, cut depth, I'm gonna go 3 uh, I'll. I don't really need to use pecking on this. Uh, so I'm going to just call this my outer outer decoration. I don't know. We'll call it something. Outer decoration. And uh, we'll calculate that toolpath. And let's preview that. And that's going to create those holes there. Right? Cool beans so far. So let's kind of zoom in. So it just creates those nice little dimples. Now let's do that as a pocket toolpath as well, just so you can see here. Now if I go as a pocket toolpath, I need to make sure that the bit that I'm using is undersized or, or you know the similar in size. It can't be bigger or it's not gonna fit. I'm gonna have that issue. So I'm gonna remove the tools that are in that pocket toolpath. I'm gonna go in with that same 3 16 of an inch and from my tool database, I will select the box score bit as well. Uh, now, it's gonna do it in two passes, kind of like two passes and all. Uh, I, at 3 16 with my box score bit, I can do that in one pass. So let's make that one. And uh, we'll go ahead and calculate that. Reset the preview and preview the selected tool path. Okay, so Either one of those two uh, will work. Uh, the drilling toolpath, if you have the appropriate size tool, uh, it's going to, whatever size that tool is, if it's a quarter inch box core, if it was a half inch or you know three eighths or whatever, then that's what size the hole is gonna be, the dimple. It's not gonna be you know, the full size of the pocket, right? So you see they're smaller here. If we come in and look at them, they're smaller because I'm only using a half inch uh, box core bit. My pocket cut is going to cut out the full size of that dimple to the depth that I specify. So if we look at the pocket cut and we prove that to well, you can see they're much bigger, right? Not much bigger, but you know, a little bit bigger because it's pocketing out that, uh, you know, that actual inside that full vector that I have drawn. Okay. So either one that either one that you want to use, uh, you can use, but just know the drilling toolpath, whatever size tools in there, that's the size hole or whatever it's going to make. Okay. All right, cool. All right. So we've got our uh, dimples and everything. Now we want to come into our uh, actual clock face and stuff. And we are actually going to select this innermost ring here. Okay, this innermost ring right here, and we're going to um, select all of the numbers and dashes and everything as well. Okay, so let's go ahead, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make it easy on myself. I'm going to select everything, hold down the shift key, deselect those outer circles, the outer rings, and I'm just going to have just the inside face and uh, vector selected. I do not want this center circle selected. I want that turned off. All right. Cool. All right. So we're going to go with a V carve tool path. And I'm going to do a flat depth of, let's go for right now, we'll start off with an eighth of an inch. Flat depth of an eighth of an inch. I'm going to use for me uh, a 60 degree V bit and look at my tools come on man let me bring my tool library back over where's my 41 um am i still in yeah i'm in 11. uh my tools are t 
turned off still. I got to go back and apply them and stuff because when I did the change on the post processors, it changed the uh, the tools. So um, let's go back. There we go. All right. So I'm going to go with the white side uh, tool database here and or the white side 60 degree V bit. I'm going to select that. That's going to be the tool, but I'm also going to use a clearance tool. Now my clearance tool, I want a tool that can pretty much get in between these spaces fairly well. Um, but at the same time, I don't want that small tool having to do all the flat work in this flat area. So I'm actually going to use two additional tools for my clearance tool. I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill as my larger tool. Okay, my quarter inch end mill. And let me go in here and hide that tool set. There we go. Uh, I'm going to select my quarter inch end mill. And I'm also going to select my eighth inch end mill. Okay, so my bigger bit's going to do a majority of the work. And then my smaller bit's going to kind of come and do some of the touch up work where, where the bigger bit couldn't fit. And then wherever my smaller bit can't fit, the V bit will come back and do the final touch up of the work. All right. All right. All right. So we're going to show you uh, on uh, how to mount the mechanism because on this particular project, we'll do the side two. I'll turn it into a two sided project and we'll make the uh, pocket on the back and stuff too. We didn't do that last week on the model. Um, so I've got the vector selected. I'm going to go a eighth inch deep. I'll probably go a little bit deeper, but I'm going to just start with an eighth of an inch, see what, I, what it looks like and if, how I like it. Uh, we're going to go with a 60 degree V bit and then my quarter inch and eighth inch end mill are going to be my clearance tools. We're going to go ahead and calculate this tool path. And we're going to preview that visible tool path. So my quarter inch end mill is doing a majority of the work. My eighth inch is coming back and cleaning up and let's uh, let's reset that and let's um, let's look at it one by one. So I've got uh, my uh, let's turn off that quarter inch end mill preview that visible toolpath. It's going to come in and do a majority. It's the larger tool of the three. It's going to come in and do the majority. My eighth inch end mill is going to uh, come in and do all the cleanup where the quarter inch couldn't fit. And then my V bit is going to come do all the final edge work and everything on the design uh, to really clean things up. Okay. So that's the clock face so far. Now I may go a little bit deeper, but right now I'm kind of digging the way the eighth inch looks as far as this goes. Remember now we haven't done our cutout or any of that stuff yet. We haven't created that profile yet. Uh, but now I want to, there is a, another set of vectors here, uh, here and here, that I'd like to make a nice little V groove um, to um, create a bit of a kind of a channel, a separation, just a little bit of an indent, if you will, um, and all. And so I'm going to select this middle ring right here and this inner ring here and this now could be an opportunity if I didn't want it to be like a little V like a little chamfer type thing I could do it as an end mill right where I just create a nice little shallow channel so I'll show you both so you can see the look and see which one you like better uh, or we can use our V bit so let's first let's start with um, doing a pocket cut with an end mill and I'm just going to go down an eighth of an inch, kind of keep things a little bit consistent. Okay, eighth of an inch. And I'm going to use my eighth inch end mill should fit in that groove just fine. It's a quarter inch wide, quarter inch spacing. So the eighth inch should fit in there fine. And um, I'm going to calculate that. Let's zoom in here and look at this clock. Let's preview that visible toolpath. And that's going to kind of create this little recess, right? And everything. Well, you know, as an end mill, it's kind of just straight edges. There's no real character and everything to it. I'm not a fan of that. I want a nice little chamfer. Okay, I want a nice little chamfer. 
So what I'm gonna do is let's reset that. Let's preview all of our tool paths. Again. And instead of the pocket this time, I'm gonna do on my selected vectors, uh, I'm going to, I could do it as a pocket still with a V bit and all, but I'm just gonna do it as a V carve, okay? I'm gonna let the V carve software calculate its own depth based on the space between those two lines and the bit that I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna remove the clearance tools, I don't need them for this, just the V bit, and I could use my 60, my 90, my 22, depending on what type of chamfer or angle that I want. In this case, I'm gonna go with the 60 degree V bit, uh, and I'm gonna calculate that, and let's preview that visible toolpath, and I'm gonna create that chamfer. Now, let's go back and look at that if I use the 90 degree V bit, okay? It's gonna be a little bit wider, V bit, which means it's gonna be a shallow cut, still gonna be the same with groove, it's not, the groove's not gonna get any wider, but it would be a shallower cut, because it is a wider bit, it'd be a shallower cut than what this is. Now this cut depth here and everything is going to be fine. Let me see if my simulation, let me turn my simulation up a little bit. And let's preview these tool paths. That simulation quality is gonna you know, eliminate some of the pixelation so it's not so blurry and pixel for you guys uh, and stuff. So we got our pockets, just gonna take a little bit longer to actually do the carve. There we go. And then our groove, right? So uh, that groove, all that does is it just creates a nice little V separation. If I did that groove as a 90 degree V bit, it would just be a shallower cut. If I did it as a 22, it would be a deeper cut, okay? So let's go back into that and let's just change this up for a minute and go with the 90 degree V bit. Calculate that tool path, reset. And preview that one more time and you'll see that shallower little groove around. I think I'm gonna like the 60 better than the 90 as far as I want a nice little chamfer because I'm gonna chamfer the other side too before I do the final cutout. And I'll show you how to do that as well. But uh, the 90 is just a little bit shallower and everything. And uh, I don't know, 90 is actually not too bad. 90 is actually not too bad at all. I think I'll stick with the 90, I kinda like it. I didn't think I would like it, but I do. I do see all right so all that does is just kind of create a nice little uh, bezel uh, ring around you know the clock face and everything and it just gives a little bit of separation right all right let's go here now to the outside here the outside of the circle here now the thing about the outside of the circle I am right up on my edge so when I go to chamfer cut this I'm gonna have a flat spot right here it's not going to be a very attractive looking chamfer. It's going to kind of have that nice chamfer that comes around, then it's going to kind of flatten off right there because I'm right up at the edge. So for me, I do want an 18 inch diameter clock. So I need to make my board just a little bit bigger, you know. So I'm going to bring my, you know, if I'm gluing my board up, I can cut it down to whatever size that I want. Uh, I'm going to bring this up and I'll just go. Uh, I don't need to waste a whole lot of wood. I'll just go 19 by 19 by three quarters. Let's get this centered on the material. And then I'm simply going to recalculate. There's a calculator right here. I'm going to recalculate all the tool paths. Okay. You guys with me so far? Cool beans. All right, let's go back into here and let's turn off this pocket and turn off this pocket. Actually, I'm gonna delete them because I'm not gonna use them. So delete that one and delete that one. All right, so just the ones I'm using. Now the cool thing about um, the uh, tool pass, I, I deleted them one at a time, but I could have checked them off and deleted the visible and all of that stuff. Uh, but I just want to clean up, 
you know, and things. All right, so let's reset the preview and preview uh, all the tool paths this time. Now that clock, the, the way I had the clock tilted, it looked like all the vectors that you're seeing on the screen, it looked like they were all up off into the right and everything, but they weren't, they were uh, positioned correctly. It was an optical delusion. All right, so we got our clock face here. Uh, now, going back here, now I have some room and I'm gonna get a nice chamfer on that edge and stuff, and so it's gonna be a profile cut. Anytime you're following a single line, whether you're cutting on that line, on the inside of the line, or the outside of the line, it's a profile tool path. So I'm gonna do a profile tool path, okay? And I'm going to uh, come in and da -da -da -da, let's pick a cut depth. I'll keep it consistent with the other side. I'll just go, um, let me see what the other side is. The thing I love about the software is I can move in to it and I can um, come in and I can look at where I'm at. So about 0 0.0946 or I can just go over that toolpath and it'll tell me the actual maximum depth of the cut. 0 0.0978 is the maximum depth of that cut. So on this profile toolpath, 0.0978 is going to be my magic number. 0.0978. Okay, now we're gonna, we also in, in version 10, I think it was 10 or 10.5 it came out, we have a chamfer tool path as well. And I told you I want a chamfer on that outer edge. Well, I'm showing you old school profile tool path, and then I'll show you new school chamfer tool path both ways, right? So that way you get the knowledge of how to do it either way. So with this, I'm gonna be using the same 90 degree V bit, okay? And let's say that, uh, let's come over here for a minute and let's say that this is my line. And let's say that this is my 90 degree V bit. And let's put a little point right in the middle there. Okay. Now, if I am cutting on the outside of the line, that means that my 90 degree V bit at the widest diameter, it's cutting on the outside of that line. So I'm not gonna get a chamfer cut that way. You know, um, I need the bit to overlap the line by a certain amount so that it cuts that chamfer, you know. Um, and uh, that step over really is going to depend on uh, the offset. So let's look at the offset. I'm gonna take a line I'm gonna draw a line and let's go 45, 45, space bar to finish. Oops, let's draw a line at the bottom here. That'll represent my wood. So this is my 90 degree V bit sitting on top of my wood here. Well, I'm gonna be cutting down 0 0.0978. So if I move this line up, move, relative in the y direction, y is up and down on your screen. If I move uh, in the positive direction, point oh nine seven eight, and move that line up, I can now, I can now measure, and I'll do a horizontal measurement, from the point of that bit to that intersection and that will give me my offset. And it happens because it's a 90 degree bit, it happens to match, 0.0978, right? So the offset matches and everything, that's cool. All right, so that's kind of my offset. So when I'm cutting on the outside of the line here, I need my bit to cut over the line, okay? And so I need it to step over some. So I'm gonna step over negative, 0.0978 and uh, let's go back to the design and select that outer ring and we'll calculate that okay so that'll come in and cut that chamfer on this side okay 
So we've got that nice chamfer. Now, I'm going to do a end up doing a profile cut to cut that out. And I need to make sure that my profile cut steps out and doesn't cut that chamfer off. If I did a profile cut with my quarter inch end mill, it's going to be cutting right up this line and it's going to cut that chamfer away. And I need to be able to step over the proper amount uh, in order to, uh, you know, so I don't cut it off. So if I come up and I check on that toolpath and I highlight here, you can see where that bit is, you know, cutting out to, right? Okay. That, uh, that distance and everything. There's no magic uh, number to tell me what that distance is and stuff, you know, but I could measure if I wanted to. I could measure and uh, I could go just length from here straight across to, let's say, here. And I'm about, you know, 0951 or whatever, but I'm going to actually use my 0978. Okay, that offset. Uh, I'm going to bring that in because notice I didn't click right on the edge of that. I'm right on the inside. So 0978 will be my offset for my profile cutout as well. That's not going to always be the case, but we happen to be using a 90 degree V bit and things kind of all equal out. All right, so let's turn that off. Let's go ahead and uh, create the profile cut. Cutting all the way through my material this time, 0.75. I'm going to use my quarter inch end mill. Going to be cutting on the outside of the line, but I'm going to this way. This time now, I want I need to step away from the line, so it's not going to be a negative number. A negative number will take me over the line. I need to be away from the line, so it's going to be a positive number. So. Um, I'm going to go positive and everything and I'll calculate that toolpath. Okay. So what I want is when it cuts now that 0978 actually was actually a little bit too far. See there, let's come in and look and see what I mean. So here's my chamfer right here, but this is the bottom of that V cut and here's where it starts to climb up. So that 0978 was, you know, that's the whole width of my V. Right, I cut right on that outer edge of it. I got to divide that in half. Forgot that step. Let's go in there and 0978 divided by 2. Let's calculate that and preview that cut. Did I miss it again? Hold on now, there, Hoss. I can't have missed it that far. No. Can't have missed it that far. Hold on now, guys and girls. Let me see here. If I go with a zero offset, that should cut. I should cut it perfectly <laughs> and here's why here's why it cuts perfectly it doesn't make sense till it makes sense uh, let's go into the 2d view the chamfer is actually starting back here when I offset the V bit inward right when I offset it inward the chamfer is actually starting back here cutting down to the line so when the end mill is cutting that line it's cutting right at the middle of that bit perfectly, cleaning it up. So my mistake, that was my mistake. There didn't, the profile cut did not need an offset. I wasn't thinking clearly uh, in everything. And I'm a goofball because if I would have thought clearly and said, okay, wait a minute, the center of my bit or, you know, my offset stepping over uh, is cutting here. Uh, that means the chamfer starting back here down to the V and then coming back up. And when my quarter inch end mill cuts, if I cut on the line, it'll clean that up nicely. So everybody makes mistakes, but it's how we correct those mistakes that matters. All right. So now we've got a nice chamfered edge there and everything for our clock. Okay. 
So the clock is taking some shape. So we've got our outer decoration toolpath. We've got our V carve with our flat depth that did all of our numbers and letters. And uh, we did our little channel to kind of create some separation from the face edge. And then a nice little chamfer to match the other side. All that happy jazz. And then the cutout. Now let's talk about our mechanisms. Okay. So I'm going to pull up a web browser here and I buy my mechanisms from uh, clock kit. Clock it .com. Oh, I'm going to spell that wrong. It, it, it is with a K. But kits. I don't want to spell it wrong. Da, da, da. C L O K I T or K L O K I T. I knew it was with a K. K L O C K. Clock with a K instead of a C. I T. Clock it. Dot com. There we go. I knew I was going to screw up a couple of times tonight. That's the one great thing about live and all. 10% off. Cool. All right. We're going to go to quartz movements here. And um, there's a variety of quartz movements depending on, you know, what, you know, type of uh, uh, size clock you're going to use or, you know, um, if you want it to have a chime or no chime or this or that and things like that. And so um, there's quite a bit to choose from. And I'm going to go with just a, it's going to be a basic, I'll go ultra thin. I don't want an atomic clock. I don't want a 24 hour clock. Let's go ultra thin here. And on the ultra thin, the one thing that I want to make sure of is uh, in the description, it gives me my shaft diameter. So that tells me how the, the diameter of the hole that I need to have in the center of that clock. Um, and let's go down to the case size. It's going to be uh, 2 and 3 16 inches square, 5 8 inches deep. So 2 and 3 16 by 5 8. Cool. All right. Now let's also look at uh, what's important is the shaft length. So this part right here on the screen, I don't know if that shows up, that part right there, that shaft length, because the threads have to be able to, I have to create my pocket deep enough so the threads poke through, so everything, you know, um, everything, you know, the nut screws on and the you know, all that good stuff to hold it in place. Um, this one is, the dial thickness is the maximum no, that's the dial thickness, 3 16 All right, bear with me a second. I have, it's been a minute. And let me go to support real quick. And let me go down to... Uh, my movements and quartz movements one of these pages tell me the there we go so the uh, shaft the threaded bushing okay the maximum dial thickness all right, that's gonna, you know, that's the maximum dial thickness. So it's got to go through the material. So my pocket's got to be deep enough, and uh, you know, and then of course we have our overall shaft length. But I need the dial thickness, the max dial thickness, because that'll tell me how deep my pocket needs to be. So let's go back to our clock. Get here and the this is a 3 16 inch max dial thickness well I want to go a little bit bigger than that right I don't want to have to cut such a deep pocket uh, in my 
in my material, you know, my three quarter inch material. So I will go with a, um, I got to take into account, I want to recess this. Uh, I'd, I'd like the clock to be flat on the wall. So no little quartz mechanism sticking out of the back of it, right? So um, I want to recess this that five eighths. So my pocket's going to at least be five eighths, okay? And then uh, that leaves me three eighths inches of material. And so for me, uh, let's see, three eighths is six sixteenths, right? Right? Yeah, three eighths. Um, nine sixteenths. I'm going to go with nine sixteenths. Had the thread sticking out just a little bit. So that would be the mechanism that I choose, right? So add to cart, blah, blah, blah. But I've got my dimensions two and three sixteenths by five eighths. And then I got my dial thickness, that uh, threaded dial thickness. Okay, 916. So cool. Let's come over here. And the diameter, shoot, just that quick. Forgot what my diameter was. 5 16 inch shaft diameter, 5 16 So here, my center hole, I'm going to size that up to uh, 5 16 0.3125. Point three one two five. Okay, I'm gonna make sure it is centered. That would suck for me if it wasn't. And uh, that's gonna be a pocket tool path. All right, so I'm gonna go pocket tool path, and I'm gonna go all the way through. 0.75. I don't technically need to go all the way through because remember, I'm gonna be pocketing out the back. You know, I just need to pierce through there. But I'll go uh, 0.75. I'm going to go with a quarter inch end mill. Calculate that. All right. Now, this depth of cut here, okay, for the first uh, eighth of an inch, it was carving air because this pocket is already an eighth of an inch down, right? So, on that pocket cut, I need to start at an eighth of an inch, 0.125. And I need to cut down uh, 0.625, another 0.625 for a total of 0.75 inches. Okay, so I gotta start, uh, there's no sense in me wasting time. It's a small movement, I mean, it's only gonna spin around a little bit, but still, I need to start down in the cut. So. Let's select that vector again. Calculate. Okay. So it'll um, start at an uh, eighth of an inch and cut another five eighths of an inch. All right. Cool beans. So let's see here. Um, it's all good. You're human. Thanks, Brooks, for understanding my mistakes. All right, now I didn't add tabs to this. We'll come back and add tabs on the profile cut. You know, we'll be responsible and all, and I'm not gonna use two-sided tape. But what I do need to do is I'm gonna go ahead and set this up as a two-sided job because I do wanna be able to cut the mechanism pocket out of the back of it and everything, right? Uh, and also, I need to redo my math thinking. I wanna see how many of you catch my mistake. Uh, just know that I made a calculation error on something when we were looking talking about the clock rack your brain see if you can think about it but first of all I'm gonna set this up as a two-sided job touch it off on the material surface for each side is fine flipping along the y-axis I'm going to still start at the bottom left corner flip my board along the y-axis and click OK alright so for those of you that racked your brain for a little bit um, when I was calculating that diameter length, I said, hey, I'm going to be pocketing out five-eighths of an inch, right, for that mechanism to sit flush in there. And then I need to be able to, you know, to go through that remaining uh, three-eighths of an inch, right? Well, 
I've already pocketed out an eighth of an inch on the face. So I only need to go through a quarter. Uh, now, knowing that, you know, I'm going to be that shaft, uh, when that mechanism is all the way up there, I have this nine sixteenths of an inch shaft here, right? So it's a little bit over a half an inch. I'm going to be going through a quarter of an inch material. And that means my mechanism is going to be sticking out. My threads are going to be sticking out about a quarter inch past. That's, I'm still okay with that. Uh, you know, that little bit of play and that little bit of room. But I need to, you know, think about those things when I'm looking at that mechanism because I could go just a little bit deeper on either my pocket side where that mechanical is going to get recessed or I could go a little bit deeper on my face and I could have went with maybe the 3 16 of an inch instead of, uh, you know, um, uh, the 9 16 I only have choice, 3 16 9 16 and I think they had a 7 16 so 7 16 would be the better choice for me. Um, let me see here, 9 16 yeah they did, 7 16 So that would be um, better, see I'm going 3 8 minus an eighth is a quarter, 7 16 will be a little bit shorter than the 9. 3 16 I could figgle with that, but I, I, I like a little bit of threads, you know, and everything. So 7 16 would be my choice. That would be the one. And those are the things you just got to think about, right? All right. Uh, yeah, how long are the hands? Because you're going to need clearance for the hands, Jerry Brown is saying. So uh, what Jerry's saying is, hey, how long are your hands going to be? Because they need to be able to clear the top of these letters and numbers and everything and all that stuff so you need that you know that height possibly and all uh depends on how long your hands are going to be well my hands are going to probably go right up under the numbers they're going to be the standard uh hands let's see here let's go back to clock hands and you know, uh, they come in all a variety of different styles and lengths and everything. Uh, and, you know, I'd want something that looks pretty cool. Uh, would I want it? Let me see here. Would I want it to go over the numbers? Maybe so. Let me measure. So let me measure, measure. All right, let's turn this off. So I'm going to measure... From the center here to, let's go to the center. Come on, snap up there, boy. So that's about five and three quarter inches, you know, center to center here and stuff. Um, and the hands, you know, they attach right at the end and all. So about five inch, five and a qu three quarter inches. Uh, and all uh, would bring my hands right up to the middle of the numbers, you know, around. If I went shorter, you know, I could go four and a half inches, uh, something like that, where it come, they come on the inside. It all really depends, but I think going over the numbers might look better aesthetically. So, uh, Jerry Brown, you know, as you point out, you need to have enough shaft that when you put your hands and everything on that, uh, that they're, you know, they're, that they clear those numbers and everything, right? So I may stick with my 9 sixteenths uh, shaft on that one. Give myself that little bit of extra room. Because that's only the threads. Then the hands go on above the threads, right? So I'll go with the 9 sixteenths. But on this, uh, let's see what we have for uh, hands. So we have these hands here that are five and an eighth. Uh, let's see, three, four, two. There's a lot of different choices uh, in things uh, on clockit.com. But let's see if we can narrow or filter our search. Uh, hand type, style, length range. Let's go five to six inches and filter that out. Oh, those are ugly. Let's get out of there. So let's clear that. 
Let's go five inches because there were seven choices on that one. Okay, so five and an eighth, five and seven eighths, that's too long for me. Five, five and a quarter, five and a half. None of those are really looking attractive except for these. I like those. So I'd probably go five and an eighth, right? So something like that, right? I could go longer if I wanted to. Uh, let's see, six didn't have any range. Uh, seven only had one choice. Those aren't bad. Seven inches long. That's on the hour hand and everything. But I think seven inches, what would seven inches take me? Um, so that'd be right about the middle of the second hands up here. That's seven inches. So I can even work with that. Right? Right. Cool. All right, so let's get rid of these measurements. Delete. All right, let's flip over now. I've created a two-sided job here so I can flip over to side two, okay? And uh, on side two, I can go ahead and create my, um, my parts. And it was two and three sixteenths for the uh, clock kit that I was using, two and three sixteenths by five eighths. Uh, but that clock, let me back up a few pages. I should just, come on, get back to it. The uh, clock size, two and three sixteenths inch, but if we look at it, it's got radius corners, okay? Uh, those radius corners are not square and all. So I wanna make sure that the shape that I draw here has radius corners on there. So I'm gonna go a little bit wider. I don't want it to be like an actual tight fit, you know? I wanna be able to fit it in there nicely without having to beat it in and things. So uh, I'll probably go, uh, if it's two and three sixteenths, I'll probably go two and a quarter. Um, so we'll go 2.25 by 2.25. And uh, let's go with a radius. And I don't know what that radius is. I'd have to, uh, I'd probably, before I cut that, I'd have that mechanism in hand. You know, I'd order it so I can, you know, measure that stuff. But we'll go with a uh, 3 8 inch radius. And we'll drop it there. Okay. And let's get rid of the one that I clicked down here for some reason. So that will be uh, my pocket cut. Now, some of these mechanisms, if we look at them on the back side, uh, let's see, the back side, some of them have this hook, right, that's flush with the back. So when, I, when it's set in there and everything, it's got this hook that kind of comes up the back. So I can't, I either, I'm going to either, if I bury that a little bit deep and stuff, uh, uh, square corners, let's bring that down a bit. And let's bring it in. It's not that wide. And let's go into node editing. Let's create an arc there. Let's size this up a little bit and bring it down. But I would, and let's center it. So I'm going to select this uh, rectangle. It would, kind of, you know, I'd want to make sure that. All right, so it always has to happen uh, at least once for some reason where I start buffering, where my cache uh, turns red, uh, the cache on my little A10 Mini Pro. I'm gonna have to call them and see about better storage. But um, it, uh, it, it always happens to me where it's buffering.
So it's saying my stream is healthy, but it's still showing me buffering. Am I buffering, guys? If I'm, am I back? Am I back? Am I back? Let me know if I'm back. So, I mean, I don't know why my cache fills up so quick on that A10 Mini Pro. Uh, it fills up so fast on the data that it's sending and it buffers. Okay. All right, let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. Uh, we should be okay. Uh, the uh, data rate's building back up. But as I was saying before we were rudely interrupted by buffering, is I would create this little area here that is going to be a little bit uh, easier. Now, I could break that off and use a keyhole toolpath. I think some people are talking about, I'd do a keyhole toolpath and everything. Uh, that would probably be you know a bit stronger uh and just in case you know i want to i don't want to break that uh metal tab off and i want to have it there just in case i want to hang it on that you know that hook for whatever reason still buffering okay guys so um We'll get back to it here in a second. Um, I want to create that pocket cut. So I want to make sure that I have this mechanism in hand so I can measure that and see what size this little pocket needs to be for that part to kind of fit in. But I'm going to assume it's this size right here for drawing purposes. And that would be a pocket toolpath. And I'd probably only, uh, you know, depending on how much I need to recess is going to determine how deep I need to go. But for now, I'm just gonna go a quarter inch deep. And I'm going to use a, a quarter inch end mill for that uh, to create that little uh, shallow tab, okay? And for the main pocket, I wanna go at least 5 eighths of an inch deep, if not deeper. So um, let's go I'll go point, uh, we'll go 5 eighths, 0.625. Uh, 5 eighths and an eighth is pretty close to, why is my brain going dead today? That's right at three quarters. That's how thick my material is. So 5 eighths it would cut through the front of that face. So I'm actually gonna have to go a half, probably go with a thicker material. I'm trying to push it with, with three quarter. So I'd probably go with a one inch clock. Oh, having a bad day. Having a bad day. All right, we're coming back guys. Holy camoly. All right. I don't know how long it'll go without buffering, but I just was informed that we have storms outside. You can tell I'm sweating now the stress. Uh, we can uh, we have storms and everything outside. Um, I, uh, I'm just gonna cut this pocket a half inch deep for right now, uh, but I'll most likely end up increasing the thickness of my material to one inch so I can go my full five eighths that I wanna go. Um, but, uh, I'll just go a half inch on that. If I go a half inch on that, then I don't really need this pocket here, um, for this upper part, but I want you to have, uh, the idea of what I'm referring to. Okay. So we've got that there and on side one, let's go ahead and preview these tool paths
<laughs> oh, my vector uh, is upside down on the other side. Uh, so on the back side here, my vector is upside down. Because you're flipping it, Laney. You're flipping it. Don't be a goofball, dude. All right, let me... Uh, Let me um, flip that and bring that down to here. And let me recalculate that toolpath. All right. Let's go back into there and preview all the sides. <laughs> See what happens when I get stressed? You know, when we start buffering, I start freaking out. Lord have mercy. Uh, but no, I was informed that we have storms tonight. Um, uh, once or twice, one of these days, one of these days, we'll have, we'll have all the means and technology and everything to create a seamless stream. All right. So, uh, looking at our clock here, we've got our mechanism. It is now facing up. Very good. Wonderful. Uh, we've got our clock and all of that wonderful jazz. Now, let's say that we wanted to add uh, one last little cool element to this. And let's see what we have for questions, first of all. Uh, let's let's go back for our Q&A. All right. So buffering, blurry. Let me get past all the buffering things. Good evening, Crystal, if you're still here. Sorry, I just saw your uh, message. I hope you're doing well. Uh, let's see, Brooks Martin, a uh, question that's off subject. It doesn't have to be on subject. That's what the Q&A is for. Any questions? Uh, how do you know when a bit is too dull or done? Uh, then is sharpening a bit an option? I mean, sharpening a bit is an option. It's not an option that I use, but many people sh have bits sharpened or they sharpen their own bits uh, and things. Uh, you could find a, you know, in your area, some, some towns or cities have uh, tool smiths that do tool sharpenings and stuff. Just make sure that, you know, they've got good reviews and all that stuff and they really know their stuff. Because, you know, when they're sharpening the tools, you know, you're removing that material. So you're losing that diameter. So you got to go in and adjust your tools, diameter and, and all of that stuff uh, and things, you know, as you sharpen. Uh, I'm an advocate for uh, replacing bits, not sharpening them, but many people can't afford to go out and buy a $50, $60 replacement bit every time they need one. Uh, so they resharpen for, you know, a few bucks, right? Uh, just make sure you get a good resharpener uh, and everything. But um, how do you know when a bit's dull or done? Uh, burning of your material, your wood, smoking, uh, it's it's tearing through the cut instead of shearing through, uh, you know, and your cut uh, starts getting a little bit more fuzzy, uh, not really that clean and stuff. Now, all of those things I just said could also be a symptom or a sign of improper RPMs and feed rates and things like that, your speeds and feeds, uh, you know, and stuff. Uh, but, um, you know, when, you're, when your bit is building up heat and burning the wood and, and uh, it's, it's tearing through the fibers of the wood instead of shearing nice, you know, nice razor cut shear chips flying off and stuff. Uh, then you, you, you know, keep your bits clean, clean your bits and, and everything or replace them. But uh, the, there's usually signs of discoloration, uh, burning of the bit tip or wood. Uh, a lot of that is burning of the pitch and resin build up on bits. So keep your bits clean. But... Um, uh, it's just, you know, not cutting. You start getting chatter a little bit, you know, that your your bit's kind of struggling through the cut. It can't remove that material fast enough to keep up with the feed rate. So, I don't know. If anybody else has a good indication of how to tell a dull bit, throw it in the chat for Brooks Martin. Um, yeah, minute hand covers the numbers. Uh All right, let me get past all these freezing comments, freezing, buffering. Uh, 
Yep, Todd, you know, uh, skipping the hook and just do a keyhole slot. We'll do a keyhole slot on here as well so you guys can see that. Uh, let's see here. Most mechanisms, you can remove the hook, but it could also uh, be a backup support for the keyhole. Exactly, Jerry Brown. Uh, let's see here. I got to get past all the blurring comments. Yep, most of the, the those hooks can be removed. Uh, a lot of people are pointing that out, and that's good. So a lot of you know these things, right? Uh, keyhole bit, keyhole bit. Let's see here. How thick? So Cecil Morrison says, how thick is the material? I thought I saw it's 0.75 of the machine. 0.105 off the face, 0.625, you're going to be cutting all the way through. Yeah, I, I, I did the math in my head, uh, Cecil. Uh, it just took me a minute for it to click, right? That's why I backed off the pocket uh, to, you know, uh, an eighth of an inch. But uh, my clocks uh, faces, I usually, we're going to go with a one inch thick material to give me a little bit more meat there and stuff. Um, but yeah, it registered. It registered. It just took a minute, Cecil. Um, let's see here. I use one inch thick for material for mine. Uh, exactly, Todd. Let's see here. Um, Laney, how long would it take to cut out this clock? Thanks, Ronnie Probert. Ronnie, Ronnie. Ronnie's always asking me about time. So, well, let's take a look here. Uh, so that back pocket and everything, little back pocket area, about four minutes right uh, on the front side of things on the front side of things we've got our outer our V carve that V carve the profile V carve profile cut and then this pocket right here does not need to have two bits so let's remove that one and recalculate it there we go so if I look at the time on this Ronnie Probert uh, about an hour and 17 minutes as it stands about an hour and 17 minutes to knock out that clock not bad now let's give it uh, a little bit of pizzazz to it okay so let's um, come in here and let's say that let's uh let's say what say you I pronounce that let's Alexa Alexa stop <laughs> Alexa's jumping in on me um let's import a bitmap and uh Let's see here. What would be a pretty cool bitmap? I'm trying to find a logo or something that, you know, it could be anything really. Let's see here. All right, let's pretend it's a firefighter clock, right? Just for shits and giggles. Uh, let's go into, excuse my language, Lord. Uh, let's go into our trace bitmap tool. Um, let's go black and white. Turn off the fading. We're going to go corner fit, 82%. Default noise filter It's a pretty clean file, so I don't need to turn it up too much. Let's go about 75 right here and preview, apply, close. All right, we've got our vectors here. So let's size this up. Now, imagine if we had some text in here. Let's go ahead and just uh, fill in some of the blanks. Uh, let's go with Tahoma. 
uh, bold, that'll be good. F I R E. We'll uh, we'll curve that in just a minute. Down here. D E P T. Period. All right. Let's start off with fire. So I'm going to size this down just a little bit here, not much. And I'm going to go into the Curve Fit Tool, uh, Edit Text Spacing and Curve Tool, not the Curve Fit Tool, guys. Edit Text Spacing and Curve Tool. And I'm just going to give it a little bit of a bend. We'll throw that there. And let's go here with the department. Let's size it down. I'm going to grab it and size it down a bit. Go into that edit text spacing and curve tool and let's kind of curve that some. All right. Of course, there's all kinds of things that you can add to this. I'm just going to add this like this for just demonstration purposes. But let's say that, you know, we want kind of this, uh, you know, area here and everything to be a little bit raised up, kind of give it a little bit of a, a nice little decorative element or something in the middle. It could be really anything that we want it to be. Now, if I'm pocketing out all this area here in the middle uh, and everything, it's going to skip this and it's going to want to pocket this area here as well. Uh, you know, to that eighth of an inch uh, depth and everything. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the V carve toolpath here, and I'm going to select the outer perimeter. Let's ungroup that. Ungroup. I'm going to uh, select that outer perimeter. Hold down that shift key, and I'll decide if I want to go down you know, how deep I want to go down in the middle, but I want that outer perimeter there. When I calculate this tool path and all, uh, let's reset that preview and preview all the tool paths on this side with that decorative element there. Um, get rid of the dot after the department. All right, all right, all right. Uh, don't be, it's just for demonstration purposes, Blue Knight. I'm not going to carve this project uh, or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, we have this uh, element here now, um, but uh, let's see, let's get rid of the dot after the department. Some, some Maltese crosses have that, but let's go ahead and get rid of the period. There we go. Close that, and let's get that centered left to right on our material. And notice here... My Maltese cross is not centered. So let's select it and not the circle here. Align to center. Oh, it is center. Why does department look off? Looks off without that period. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so once again, we'll... Uh, calculate uh, that tool path and so we have this kind of raised element here in the middle right cool now let's go in and take and let's select these inside vectors here turn off everything else select the inside vectors in the text all right I'm gonna go with a flat depth of a sixteenth of an inch on this 1.0625 uh, with my 60 degree V bit, my quarter inch end mill, and my eighth inch end mill. I'm going to calculate that. Preview that visible tool path. Okay. And I also want the center of my clock uh, here. Now, that center, I could leave it like that, and that gives me that more meat that I need for my hands to be above my clock, right? So I could, you know, by adding that meat right there, you know, I, um, I'm not down an eighth of an inch anymore. I've added that material back up there. 
So that could be a good thing for me, but I do want a little bit of something there. So I am going to bring it down. You know, it could be a 32nd, it could be a 16th, it could be whatever. Uh, but I will, I'm going to go ahead and bring it down um, a 16th. So I'm going to select this inner circle right here. And that's going to be, actually it's going to be part of this whole pocket right here. Let's select this again. Hold on. That's not the pocket. Is that the pocket I just created? No. Did I just delete that pocket? Hold on a second. I know I'm not going delusional. Undo. Where the hell did that toolpath go, guys? <laughs> it's not that toolpath. That's the hole. Wow, that's strange. All right, we'll do it again. Uh, I could have swore. Did I not just preview this toolpath right here? Where would that pocket go for the fire department? I just did undo, and it's not there. Where would it go? It mysteriously disappeared. All right, no big deal. Let's go back and select those vectors again. Very strange. I know I'm not going delusional. Okay. Pocket tool path. I'm going to cut down a sixteenth of an inch, 0 0.0625. With a... It's not a pocket tool path. It's a V-carve tool path. That's why I'm not recognizing it. There we go. Calculate. Okay, it wasn't a pocket toolpath. That's why I couldn't find the word pocket. All right, so now I've got this clock face here um, that has, you know, this symbol in the middle, right? Uh, it could be uh, fire department, police department. It could be dragons, Dungeons and Dragons, whatever, right? Whatever you want it to be. It could be something very uh, simple. Uh, you know, it could be fun, you know, a little happy face. Who knows, right? But by bringing those vectors in and using that outer perimeter of that vector with my original pocket toolpath, that creates that island for whatever that emblem happens to be or whatever that design happens to be that you create. It creates that island, gives it that raised effect. So, you know, we have that raised effect there and everything. And, uh, you know, so that clock face could be, you know, uh, whatever design you want it to be. This is where, you know, you can utilize your imagination. This is quick and dirty, me just throwing in this Maltese cross and stuff. But um, uh, it's just for illustration purposes, uh, you know. So we've taken these vectors that were imported that we created in last week's class. Very simple and easy to create these. Watch last week's class, the very beginning, when we were laying out these vectors. And learn how to lay out those vectors um, and everything. Uh, but, you know, we have the clock vectors creating our tool pass to create those dimples with our box core bit. Uh, create our V-carve tool path to create those raised letters, numbers, and second dashes and minute hands and all that stuff. Uh, our profile cut to create that nice little defining chamfer and then another chamfer on the outer edge and then our final profile cut cutting out and then you know doing some if we have a design in the middle doing some uh, cutting on this now by adding that design there I've increased this center area by a sixteenth of an inch because that's how low this pocket is from the original surface so that means my hole my hole here, I need to go back into that hole cut and I don't want to start at an eighth of an inch. I'm going to start at a sixteenth of an inch, you know, so you got to keep track of what you're doing in your tool pass and everything. And I'm uh, going to, um, I'll just add in a sixteenth here, 0.6875. So I'm starting at a 16th and I'm cutting 0.6875 to cut all the way through. But you got to keep track of that. So if I, 
you know, if I'm starting, if I would have left that starting at an eighth to cut through, then it would have kind of buried that bit down, you know, that first eighth plus the first pass, you know, whatever it is, another eighth, so a quarter of an inch for the first pass and stuff. Um, but very simple uh, V-carb method of creating the same similar clock face uh, to what we did with Aspire and creating it as a model, right? Uh, and, um, you know, we get a nice clean looking clock. So let's uh, preview. Let me recalculate this toolpath real quick, first of all. That's my little hole drilling. All right. And then uh, we'll cut the uh, back out here so we have the full view. Okay. So we got our back pocket and everything for our mechanism. Do the math, have that mechanism ordered and in hand when you're kind of doing your design. You can lay out your preliminary, but just make sure everything is right, you know. Make sure this the shaft is sticking up far enough that you can get the nut on it. Make sure the the whole shaft is sticking out far enough that when you put your minute and second hand and stuff like that, or hour hand, minute and hour hand, uh, or second hand too, make sure all those are uh, you know clearing, you know those numbers and stuff, and not running into them or too low and any of that. All of those things come into play. So, um, but you can have some fun with it. All right, let's go back now and. All right, uh, David Kinsey says, what's the best way to get all the bits to the exact depth when using multiple bits as you did on the face of the clock? What's, what's the best way to get them to the same depth, David Kinsey? So when I'm carving with my quarter inch end mill, you know, I'm zeroing out on the top of my board and I carve with my quarter inch end mill when it's finished and I come back and change to my eighth inch end mill and touch off the Z for that, you know, to do that second cut and then the V bit, touch off the Z for that to do that third cut. You're saying, what's the best way to get all three to the same depth? Be accurate with your touch off. If you're not accurate with your touch off, then a workaround is my first bit I can touch off on the surface of the material. Zero it out, right? Zero it out. If I'm on a touch plate, 10 thousandths of an inch, 0 0.01, whatever it is, but I can use my touch tool and I can set my initial zero. If I am worried that my I can't do my touch offs accurately or my machine is not accurate enough to do the touch offs accurately uh, in things uh, and I wanna make sure that all the bits cut to the same depth, then for my second bit, my eighth inch bit, instead of touching off on the surface of the material, I'm going to run that bit into this pocket and I'm going to lower it down and I'm going to have it kissing the face of that pocket down here at the bottom. I'm going to have that bit just barely kissing that face and I'm going to program into my software that this is negative 0 0.125. I'm going to tell my software that this space and time where that bit is sitting that is 0 0.125 negative below zero. So that way, when I run that tool path, that bit's gonna cut because it's cutting to an eighth minute, it's gonna cut to that depth, that consistent depth. I'll do the same thing for the V bit if I'm worried that my zero touch tool and everything isn't going to be accurate enough to be repeatable. Uh, I'll run the V bit in there and bring that bit down till it's just kissing that surface, just kissing it right there. You know, I should see a little bit of uh, you know that that point of that bit and I would program the software Z negative 0 0.25 or 125.125 um, And uh, I'm telling the software that hey where that bit is sitting in this space and time. That's this depth and From there it'll program the Z automatically what it is It may not be the top of your board or whatever if you you know, but it should be the top of your board, right? Uh, if your bits are cutting the, the proper depth um, but uh, that's my way of my, my little workaround or work assurance that my, all of my bits cut to the same depth. 
Otherwise, if you you know if you're using let's say the digital wood carver, your little uh, flat touch plate, and you're worried that you didn't get a good touch off of that touch plate because it might have flexed or bent or something, then go with the accessory of the DWC Quick Set Zeroing Tool. Uh, accurate, repeatable touch offs every time. Uh, very accurate, repeatable touch offs. So the DWC Quick Set Zeroing Tool. Uh, it's a corner block, X, Y, Z automatic touch-offs, and it automatically sets Z on tool changes and everything in the Planet CNC software. Go with, go with a tool that's going to give you that accuracy. Or use workarounds, like I just said. All right, so that's how I would go with that. Uh, let's see here. Change color at the top to black. So... Uh, he's wanting to do a fill color of black, right? Changing that fill color to black. Let me see if my light's turned on. No. Okay, good. All right. So, that's that with black. All right, let's see here. I'm still here doing good. Oh, oh hey, Crystal. <laughs> She's in, I'm reading the questions late. Check question at 731. All right, guys, when you ask a question mark, put uh, when you ask a question, put some question marks or something in front of the question you ask so I can easily identify your questions in the comment section uh, because I, I don't have time stamps. What, was, uh, what, what question am I supposed to be looking for at 731? Um, I, I don't have timestamps, bud, in the chat. So put question marks in front of your questions so I know I can I easily identify them. Um, uh, Brooks Martin. Uh, let's see here. SR seventy one question mark. Let me know what that means, bud. Uh, Big Daddy Fish, you are adding a medallion in the middle, so your face thickness is going to be more. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I did a compass in the center of mine uh, and the north, south, east, and west uh, at the uh, quarter hours. Very cool. Very cool, Todd. Um, I get rid of the dot after September or after department. I lost you for a main. How did you curve out the text? I lost you for a minute. How did you carve out the text? On the fire department, that toolpath was a V-carve toolpath with the text and the vectors surrounding that text were selected. So all the inside vectors of the Maltese cross were selected, except for that circle. That's not part of the Maltese cross right there in the middle. Uh, and what that does is with the V-carve toolpath with a flat depth, I only went down a sixteenth of an inch, that carves around the letters, giving them that raised look. Let's turn that color off uh, for a moment. Okay, so it gives those letters that raised fill and everything. It carves around them to give it raise and all. So it's a V-carved toolpath with a flat depth. Using, in my case, I'm using a quarter inch end mill and an eighth inch end mill to do all the flat work. And a 60 degree V-bit to do the V-carved edge work and everything. So that's how the text was carved. Same way that the text was carved for all the numbers and dashes and everything. Okay. Cool beans. All right. Um, we still got to create the keyhole toolpath. Let's see here. A navy emblem would look cool. Right. Right. Uh, it looks like a portal. You could do a navy emblem portal. Uh, you could do all kinds. Of, I mean, really, it could be anything. Uh, you know, it could be your company logo. It could be, you know, um, uh, something that your you know friends or family like or whoever would buy it you know it could be a cartoon character it could be uh, uh, you know Star Wars Star Trek Game of Thrones whatever the case may be uh, Fortnite you know type clock you can have all kinds of fun with it so that emblem could really be anything that you want use your imagination and all and it could, you can have some fun it could be a decorative flower it could be you know whatever fits with you know what you would like uh, let's see here. Um, 
Very good, Laney. How do I get the file? Um, I tell you what I'll do on this one. Uh, the vectors for the clock. The vectors for the clock. I will make that DXF file downloadable in the uh, description of the video after the class ends. Give me about a half hour and I'll have that DXF file for the clock here. Uh, available as a free download in the description. Okay, let's see here. Uh, not asking you to do this, but could you bring the hands? Could you bring in the hands just to see the different links? Could I bring in the hands to see the different links? Um, I mean, I couldn't bring in the hands of the image and the picture and all, but I can draw a set of hands. So let's see here. Uh, let me do it over off to the side so I don't have all that stuff in my way. Uh, let's go create a circle here and here. Let's draw a rectangle here. Let's get that centered to the circle left to right, a line left to right. Let's go into node editing and give it a little bit of pizzazz. Uh, let's grab a rectangle and throw it up here. square corners on this one. All right, on this I'm gonna go into node editing. I'm going to, right on the center point, I'm gonna insert a point and then I'm gonna delete this point over here and delete this point over here to create that triangle. Uh, let's drag this in a quarter of an inch. Let's drag this in this way, 0.25, enter. I'm typing in the number. Um, and let's get things, I gotta fix my, this looks ugly right here, this handle. We're gonna trim it all up in just a minute. Let's go in and clean this up first. That looks about even. Go in here and select this vector first, this vector last, align left to right, and then weld these three things together. Okay, not the prettiest looking hand, a little crooked on the curve down here. Let's go back into node editing. Let's see here. Not the best looking hand, but it'll do. All right, let's grab here and let's go into the size tool. And overall size on this one is four. Let's go 5.125. That was five and an eighth. The, uh, uh, the one clock hand that I found in there. So if we take, let's group that together and drag it over here and snap it to the center. All right. Okay, so five and an eighth brings me just under. All right, so let's go in there and let's change that size to five and three quarters. That brings me just up into the clock, probably a little bit longer than that, but it gives you a general idea. Uh, let's go with, what was the other one? Seven, I believe it was, the seven inch handle. Uh, seven. Okay, that brings me right up to about here. So, and let's, I'm stretching that circle, but you get the idea. Uh, so, you know, I can't bring the actual pictures of the clock in. That's just, it's gonna take too much time to do that, bud. But that gives you a general idea. You know, you can always draw it in you know, drawing the size, drawing any kind of shape. It could be a rectangle for all I care. Just draw it in so you can kind of get a gauge what the length needs to be for your hands, right? All right, uh, let's see here. 
Um, hey, Lenny, are you using your tablet now? And how many shortcuts have you programmed for Aspire? Um, I only use my tablet. Uh, he's referring to my Huey on tablet here. I only use that for uh, when I'm creating models in, um, in ZBrush. I very rarely use it uh, for uh, the Vectric software, but I do have you know, my basic uh, control Z shortcut set in uh, and uh, node editing and a few other keys uh, set up, but I mostly use it for when I'm designing my models in ZBrush. So my tablet uh, gets used when I, um, it doesn't really get used when I'm using um, VCarve Pro. Uh, let's see here. Uh, a paper thickness. Brooks Martin, a paper thickness? What's that? SR71 would look as bad as you bitmap. SR71. Oh, SR71, is that a paper thickness? Is that some kind of paper thickness or something? I don't know. Let me know. Can... Um, how did you curve the text? Oh, not carve. How did you curve the text? How did I curve the text? So in the text, over here in your text tools, edit text spacing and curve tool when you click on that you'll have two green nodes one that you know allows you to pull the text up or flat at the top and then one at the bottom where you could curve the text you know this way so just grab that top node and pull the text up until it looks you know fairly decent so that's one way of curving the text just quickly and easily. Or I could have drawn an arc. Let's go to the middle here. Go to the middle here and pull an arc. About like that. And I could use the text on a curve tool. So with that, I could select my text. I could select the curve and I need to be on the curve in the middle and align text to curve and I could do it that way as well uh, it kind of bunches me up a little bit right there so I want to adjust my text spacing right so I can space my letters out with that tool and of course you want to make sure that the arc you know that you're curving it on is uh, correct but if I'm doing a simple arc of the text, I'm not going to use the curve tool. I'm going to use the edit text spacing and curve tool so I can just pull that into you know, the curve that I want. If it's just a general arc, I use the edit text spacing and curve tool. But you do have the other curve tool here where you draw a curve and you have the text follow that curve. Okay, so that's the two ways to curve text. Edit text spacing and curve or text on a curve cool uh, let's see here I think you use the curve tool yep blue knight I did um, thank you for making the vectors downloadable very generous as usual thanks Rob you're welcome uh, thanks ZBrush we'll check that out uh, ZBrush it's a 3d modeling software uh, for the basic ZBrush program it's eight hundred ninety five dollars somewhere around eight hundred nine hundred dollars uh, and uh, it is um, it is, uh, it's intense, uh, but uh, it's powerful. Lot to learn, big learning curve, big learning curve. Huge, huge learning curve in ZBrush. But once you get it down, the basics and all, it's pretty powerful. Uh, paper thickness for Z zeroing. Oh, yeah, you can use a paper. Uh, I don't use paper. But uh, you can use a piece of uh, copy paper or something or a business card. Uh, what he's referring to is uh, if I don't have a touch plate, if my machine doesn't have a touch plate, a lot of people use a business card or they'll use a little piece of paper. Uh, and, um, you know, they'll bring that bit down to that bit, grips that paper, you know, nice and flat on the toilet, so it grips that paper. And you'll just zero out your Z there. 
most people just zero out the Z um, uh, Brooks they normally don't put in the paper thickness but uh, if if you want to know what the paper thickness is uh, let's say that we have a uh, 24 mil paper thickness not 24 mil a uh, pound 24 pound uh, oh god I haven't done pound in a while uh, LB more bound paper thickness um, so it starts at 20 thickness and let's see here um, paper thickness and they usually have somewhere uh, I should how thick how thick is 24 pound paper there we go how ask the question properly and Google shall answer uh, so in metric grams uh, a square meter it's 89 caliper it calipers out at 0 0.0045 inches thick uh, so uh, 0 0.003 to 0 0.004 is a human hair, so you're just under human hair. So most people, when they're when they're touching on that paper, depending on what thickness paper you have, right? What weight paper? Um, business cards are a little thicker, and things, but um, you know you can look it up, and uh, it's going to be the caliper thickness, right? Cool, cool, cool. All right, let's see here. Uh, was I? Oh, SR-71 was a highly aptitude spy plane. Cool. It was a spy plane. That's why I didn't know anything about it. It was undercover. Uh, yes, amazing was designed in the 50s. Uh, you're doing well, Lainey. Thanks for another amazing class. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. I like those little push-along kudos every once in a while. All right, guys and girls. Uh, so that is uh, how we take some simple vectors, import them in to a... Uh, program like vCarve Desktop or Pro or even Aspire and rather than building the model like we did last week we could just simply do a combination of pocket cuts and profile cuts and vCarve toolpaths with flat depths uh, to create a really uh, decent and nice looking clock um, you know in its very uh, you know most basic form uh, and that's what I wanted to show as I was going through and answering questions for folks uh, and I appreciate all of your questions and stuff. Um, if I missed any of your questions, retype them really quick down in the bottom, especially the one that was at timestamp 731, whatever question that was, whoever asked that question that I did not answer, uh, throw it down in the chat right now and I'll answer it. Um, and uh, good night, Crystal. I think she's still here. Good night, everyone. Good night, Crystal. Good night. Uh, so, um, but just a very quick and simple way uh, to uh, make a nice clock if you don't have the modeling capabilities you don't really you know don't feel like limited I mean you can still create a beautiful clock face uh, that um, just using your regular V carve tool path your flat depth uh, pocket cuts profile cuts and all that stuff so um, it's uh, it's really straightforward and once you once you learn if you and I know I'm talking fast in the classes and stuff like that but that's why they're recorded so you can pause and rewind and go back but once you make one of these I don't care what designs in the middle you can make a hundred of them uh, once you learn how to design and, and use your vcar toolpath to create those flat depths and those raised letters and things like that once you get a couple of those little projects into your design belt it's rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. It's the same steps every single time. The only thing that changes is your design, you know, or maybe your depth of cut or the V bit that you're using. But as far as the process, it's the same. And it kind of becomes easier. At first, it could look intimidating if you're a newer user and like, man, I didn't follow any of that. 
Um, these classes are recorded. Go back and watch and, and pause and, and, and try it. Pause and try it. Whatever you need to do. Watch it two or three times. I know it's a two-hour class, but still, uh, you know, practice makes perfect. And once you get one or two good things under your you know belt, then you can start filling in that center area with all kinds of designs. Harley Davidson football, this, that, and all. Just be careful if you se don't sell Harley Davidson stuff or collegiate stuff without proper licensing and everything. But um, uh, you know, it could be whatever design you want it to be. It could be a heart for Valentine's Day. It could be a Valentine's Day clock, which is only good once a year, but. Uh, you know, it could be a Christmas clock that you bring out every year. You know, it has Santa in the middle or Rudolph or, you know, whatever. It could be a Disney clock for your kid's bedroom, you know, because they're just such a, you know, a uh, Mickey Mouse fan or whatever the case may be. So all kinds of fun stuff that you can do with some very basic uh, layout, right, in the software and all. All right. If you did like this, uh, hit the thumbs up button. I will make the clock face, not the... Uh, not the um, Maltese cross, but the clock face vectors. I'll make those available. Uh, the center will be empty. You can uh, cr you know, add whatever vectors or images you want to add in there. Uh, but I'll make those available. I'll put them in the download. Uh, I'll put a download link for those that DXF file in the description of the video. Uh, it'll be in there in about, give me about 30 minutes after class ends and it'll be in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, really good stuff. Hopefully you picked up some things from there. Hopefully some of your questions were answered. And uh, well, let's go and answer a couple more questions before we say our final, final goodbyes. And we have... Um, thanks, uh, Famanda Cheese. Uh, let's see here. Carl. Carl asks, using Pro 10.5, thinking about going to Vetric Aspire, or going to Aspire 11. Should download as a new user or migrate to Pro. So, okay, you currently have VCar Pro 10.5, and in that 10.5, you have your post processors, your tool database, and everything of the tools that you've used, your current settings, tools that you might have added, and everything. Now, regardless of if you're going to Pro 10.5 to Pro 11 or Pro to Aspire, and you're upgrading and everything. You're still, when you do that install, it's going to ask you if you want to migrate your tool database and your post processors over from VCAR Pro 10.5, the software that it knows that's already on your computer. It's going to ask, hey, do you want to migrate that stuff over to the new? And you're going to make sure all the little boxes are checked and you're going to click migrate and migrate it over. Now, um, that's right at the beginning of the install. It's, as soon as you go next, next, next install, Right at the end, it's going to you know come up and it's going to ask if you want to migrate everything over. And then it's going to ask you to license your software. Or it might ask you to license first, then migrate. But it's in one of those two orders. Uh, and uh, that's instantly. So you can bring over from Pro 10.5 to Aspire. It's the same tools, same machine. You're just changing software, right? Uh, you're just getting all the same tools that's in Pro, but you're getting more 3D modeling tools in the Aspire software and, and other enhancements and things. Um, but uh, you'd migrate over. Uh, if it didn't migrate properly or it didn't bring over your post process and all, then you're going to import those in uh, through the uh, setup like I showed you at the beginning of class. And if you weren't here, Carl, at the beginning of the class, uh, the first five to ten minutes of this video, when it's on the channel, the first five or ten minutes is how to set up your Vetric uh, 11 software. It doesn't matter if it's Desktop Pro or Aspire. How to set up your Vetric 11 software with setting up your machine configurations and tool database and post processors and all. So go back and watch that. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, interchangeable clock faces for sure. All right. Yep. And David, you're welcome uh, and all that stuff. All right, everybody, hopefully you um, enjoyed this. Hopefully you got something out of it. And uh, you will get definitely something out of it. You'll get the vector files for it. But hopefully you got some lessons out of it and stuff. And hopefully the stuff we talked about in the beginning helped you and everything. That's what the goal is for this. Uh, but we've run on. Uh, we're at 2 hours and 15 minutes now. So I am going to say goodbye. We're going to end it here. Uh, so until next week. 
Uh, I'll see you soon. But don't leave just yet. Don't leave just yet. I, I almost forgot to make this important announcement. So you know really quickly, you know where I'm rebranding some things, not Spindle TV, but we're uh, rebranding my other YouTube channel and we're getting ready to launch our new website uh, and everything. And I'm going to be making a big announcement for that. But one of the things I'm most excited about is uh, I have uh, uh, teamed up, teamed myself up with a modeling company uh, that make 3D and 2.5D models and everything. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to be providing their models uh, for sale on the website for download. Uh, there's going to be a package of 10 models that will be downloadable for free when the website launches. Uh, but man, they do some beautiful work. And there's going to be the ability to do, if you ever need custom models or anything done, uh, submitting images and doing custom models. And before I leave, I just want to show you an example of uh, kind of their portrait, taking a portrait to model to a carving. I want to show you that example uh, and everything. And uh, this is uh, models by... Um, uh, Elena uh, Zapala and uh, the Starlin team. Uh, I th let me make sure that I pronounce it right because I'm, you know, uh, I don't want to, I do not want to uh, mispronounce it. Bear with me a second here. I know Elena, Elena Zapala. Uh, and, uh, but uh, let's see, what's going to be the official branding name when I promote these? Come on here. Bear with me. Bear with me. I'm pulling it up. I should have been prepared. I wanted to make this announcement. Um, but, uh, yeah. Elena Zapala and the Surgeon Surgeon team. So they are top modelers on the, their models. You've seen them everywhere on the market and everything. But let me show you an example of their portraits. Uh, and uh, where'd it go? It's hiding. Come back here. All right. So this is a, uh, like, you know, let's imagine you were uh, submitting an image, right? You were submitting an image, a portrait or something. You wanted a custom model work done. Um, and you know, you wanted it to be carved. Uh, here's a sample of the model that was created from that image and all. Uh, so there's going to be the ability to do, uh, you know, uh, to request custom images and all, or to, to submit images, like if you need models made up. So we'll have the team to do that now, uh, uh, through the website. Uh, but, uh, you know, to finish carving. Uh, and everything all from images that you submit so that's going to be cool I love the fact about the custom portraits they do beautiful portrait work uh, as far as uh, some model samples uh, I can show off some of the 10 pack free models uh, so here's a nice little uh, bear and stream model uh, nice little cross model here there's a horse nice wolf you know a couple of raccoons and a log some roses. These are kind of like the little tin pack, the free pack and everything uh, that I'll be giving away on the website and all. Um, but, uh, and that's not one of them. That's just one of my other pictures. And uh, yeah, so uh, very cool stuff. Uh, so uh, I'll be working with the team, uh, you know, Elena Zapala and her team, the surgeon team. Uh, they do beautiful models. They do beautiful custom work and everything. And I uh, I'm going to be working with them to provide their models. I'm going to be uh, obtaining a lot of their models that I'm going to be purchasing to be able to uh, uh, sell to you guys and stuff. And it's going to be cool. Uh, so we're going to have some really nice, beautiful models and files and all kinds of downloadable projects on the new website when it launches. And I can't wait till we get ready to launch so I can really officially announce it. But really good stuff and all of that. Um, Blue Knight, uh, what about uh, Blue Knight? Specify what you mean about trademarks. Uh, Elena and them, uh, they create these models from scratch. They, they, they own these models. So they build them 
using ArtCam, ZBrush, and other programs and everything. Uh, they are a full-fledged, they build. Uh, all the way back from when ArtCam was just starting and stuff. What do you mean about trademarks? Uh, let me know. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to all of that stuff and everything. Gadget migration. Uh, that's not a question, Big Daddy Fish. What do you mean by gadget migration? What's that? Gadget migration. Gadgets already migrate over into the Vetric software, if that's what you're talking about, like your gadgets and all. That all that's all already loaded into your software and all in your gadget list. It should automatically read that automatically from the gadget library. All right, everybody. Um, I think that's what you were asking, Big Daddy Fish. Gadget migration, like how would you do that? Um, you can, uh, in your gadgets, you can install a new gadget under gadgets install a new gadget and you can pull their gadget folders from your C drive uh, let's see here uh, so from your C drive users public public documents vetric files gadgets so you can go into your 10.5 gadgets, whatever gadgets you have in there, and you can pull them over and all. But, you know, I just installed uh, this here, and all the gadgets are already installed. I, I did not import any gadgets over or pull any or anything over. They're, all, they're, they're already there. That's part of the default. Okay? So cool. All right, everybody. Until next week, I will see you soon. I hope you enjoyed the class. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate you all. Have a good night. Jeff, you're coming in right at the end. We're leaving. So you'll have to watch it non-live. You'll have to watch it uh, on the recorded. And, uh, and uh, catch us next week live. All right, everybody. See you later.